Welcome to Magnificat.tv News, dedicated to bringing you news from the church. Today is Wednesday, June 19th, 2019. The Vatican has published a document warning about the dangers of gender ideology and defending the rights of families and youngsters. The Pope has met with Annuncios and has asked them, among other things, not to criticize him behind his back and to obey the guidelines they receive. Two cardinals, Burke among them, and two bishops, have submitted a summary of the Catholic faith. They did this in order to mitigate the confusion in the Catholic Church. Monsignor Vigano gave a long interview, insisting that the Pope knew about the sanctions imposed by Pope Benedict XVI on ex-Cardinal McCarrick. The Archbishop of Philadelphia, Monsignor Chaput, has accused the Democratic Party of the United States of having made abortion a wicked sacrament. The Congregation for Education has published a document endorsed by the Pope which is very critical of gender ideology. The Congregation for Catholic Education has published a document titled Male and Female He Created Them, with which aims to guide and support those who have to confront this ideology from an educational point of view. The prefect of this congregation and responsible for this document, Cardinal Giuseppe Versaldi, said that we are being presented with the risk of a unique way of thinking to be imposed in schools as a scientific mindset, which we cannot accept. The document specifies that the anthropological disorientation that greatly characterizes the cultural climate in our time has contributed to dismantle the family with a tendency to cancel the differences between man and women, considered to be just as a simple effect of a historical cultural conditioning. The attempt to get over the fundamental distinctions between a man and a woman, as it happens in intersex or in transgender, leads to a masculine and feminine ambiguity that presumes, in a contradictory way, a sexual difference which pretends to deny or overcome. No more criticisms of the Pope or participating in blogs, and more obedience. This is what the Holy Father has requested of the nuncios in a meeting held at the Vatican. The Holy Father has received at the Vatican the attendees to a pontifical representative's meeting from June 12th to the 15th. He has told them that a nuncio is a man of God, of the Church, of communion, and that it is incompatible to be a pontifical representative and to criticize the Pope behind his back. In his speech, the Pope presented some kind of decalogue aimed to the nuncios but also to his contributors and, in fact, to all bishops, priests, and consecrated people everywhere in the world. First and foremost, he has told them that the nuncio must be a man of God and a man of the Church, because he does not represent himself, but the Church, and specifically Peter's successor. The Pope added, It is ugly to see a nuncio who seeks the brand's luxury, garments, and objects in the midst of people lacking the essential. It is counter-witnessing. To be a man of the Church also requires the humbleness to represent the face, the teachings, and the standpoints of the Church. In other words, to leave aside personal convictions. He went on to say, as a pontifical representative, the nuncio does not represent himself, but the successor of Peter. And he acts on his behalf in front of the Church and of governments. Therefore, it is not compatible to be a pontifical representative and to criticize the Pope behind his back, to have blogs, or even to join groups that are hostile to him, to the Curia, and to the Church of Rome. Cardinal Burke and several other bishops have presented a summary of the Catholic faith. In doing so, they hope to mitigate the prevailing confusion in the Catholic Church. Cardinal Raymond Burke and Janice Pujats, along with three other bishops, have made public a declaration of truths of the faith in order to mitigate the almost universal doctrinal confusion and disorientation that in the Church of today endangers the spiritual health and eternal salvation of the souls. They claim, at the same time, has to be acknowledged a generalized lethargy in the exercise of the magisterium in the different hierarchy levels of the Church today, 
This is due mainly to the neglecting of the apostolic duty, and, as Vatican II also manifests, of the separating his flock from the mistakes that threaten it. The faithful, who are suffering spiritual hunger, feel abandoned, and therefore they are in some kind of existential periphery. Such situation urgently demands a specific remedy. The bishops advise in their letter, in the eyes of the divine judge and in self-consciousness, each bishop, priest, and layperson has the moral duty to be a faithful witness to those truths which nowadays are mixed up, undermined, and denied. Monsignor Vigano answered 40 questions in the Washington Post, in which he insists that the Pope knew everything concerning ex-Cardinal McCarrick. Since his first and extensive interview in August, when he requested Pope Francis' resignation, whom he accused of covering up a sexual abuser, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, he maintained email correspondence for two months with the Washington Post in order to answer about 40 questions. For Monsignor Vigano, Pope Francis is not only doing very little to punish those who have perpetrated abuses, but he is doing nothing at all to expose and to bring justice to those who for decades have helped and covered up the abusers. Vigano insisted that Pope Francis, and not only him, by June of 2013, already knew all they needed to know. However, most certainly my statement last August precipitated this punishment, switching the focal point to McCarrick, and shifting it from those who knew, since a long time ago, about his crimes and took advantage of his protection. He added, I firmly repeated again before God, Pope Francis knew, found out about McCarrick from me on Sunday, June 23rd of 2013, 40 minutes before the Angelus. I spoke to him about the abuses perpetrated by McCarrick right after the Pope, on his own initiative, asked me about the Cardinal. He also gave some words about the gay mafia that exists, according to him, among the bishops. He said it is related not to a common sexual interest, but to a common interest that aims at mutually protecting and promoting themselves from a professional point of view, sabotaging all Reformation efforts. Asked about the risk of a schism, he said, A schism is the most terrible pain that the Church could bear, and, as history shows, it can have long-lasting effects. We have to pray that this disaster never recurs. A formal schism doesn't seem viable for now. However, there is a de facto schism based on the acceptance of rejection of the sexual revolution. For Monsignor Chaput, the Democratic Party has embraced the abortion cause with such passion they have turned it into a wicked sacrament. Monsignor Chaput, Archbishop of Philadelphia, has criticized U.S. Vice President and possible Democrat candidate Joe Biden, same as other Catholics from his party, for gradually abandoning every stance against abortion. Joe Biden represented a moderate position about abortion in the Democratic Party. In the years immediately after the Supreme Court ruling which legalized abortion in the U.S., the then-Senator Biden criticized the law. Biden was one of the legislators, some of them Democrats, who attended the first pro-life rallies in Washington. But as his party advanced toward extreme stances about abortion, Biden also did. A month ago, he announced that he would defend the federal laws that restrict the financing of abortions with public monies. This prompted criticism toward him from other members of the party. After such critics, Biden announced that he didn't support anymore the Hyde Amendment which forbids the use of federal funds for the abortions, except in cases of rapes, incest, or when the life of the mother is at risk. For the leaders of the Democratic Party, in their power assessment, a child about to be born is worth exactly zero, and the right to have an abortion, which in its day was defined as a tragic necessity, is now some wicked kind of sacred sacrament, assures Monsignor Chaput. The Archbishop recalls a comment from St. Thomas More in the movie A Man for All Seasons. When state men abandon their own private conscience because of their public duties, they take their nation on a short path to chaos. Our editorial this week is dedicated to commenting on the Vatican document on gender ideology. Desde el inicio de su pontificado, el Papa Francisco ha dejado bien clara su oposición a la ideología de género. Incluso los más 
críticos de la exhortación apostólica a morir Leticia no pueden negar que ahí hay un alegato radical, clarísimo, contra ese tipo de imposición que el occidente o algunas naciones del occidente desarrollado quieren obligar a admitir, quieren imponer a otro tipo de naciones menos desarrolladas. Eh, para el Papa Francisco es clarísima la defensa de la vida desde la concepción a la muerte natural. Y también, lógicamente, la defensa de la etapa intermedia, es decir, que haya unas condiciones de vida dignas del ser humano durante todo el desarrollo de la vida. Pero, repito, es clarísima la eh, oposición a la ideología de género con todos sus derivados, por ejemplo, el matrimonio, la legalización del matrimonio homosexual, la equiparación de ese tipo de unión con la familia, la posibilidad de que puedan adoptar niños. Insisto, basta con leer todo lo que él ha dicho una y otra vez. El Papa se ha opuesto a esos temas. Otra cosa es que algunos no hayan querido darse por enterados. Esa es otra cuestión. Ahora el Vaticano ha publicado un documento, Varón y Mujer los creo, ese es el título, ha venido publicado por la Congregación para la Educación Católica, pero, pero es evidente que no se habría publicado sin el permiso explícito del Papa, y además que está en sintonía con todas las enseñanzas del Papa Francisco. Es un documento sobre la ideología de género y contra la ideología de género. En la misma línea, repito, que las enseñanzas del Papa y de forma particular en la misma línea que la Amoris Leticia. Creo que merece la pena leerlo, es un documento amplio, pero que no se lee con dificultad. Es verdad que se, se abre a un diálogo pero un diálogo necesario con aquellos que están eh, defendiendo que a los homosexuales no se les persiga, no se les eh, trate con violencia y no se menoscaben sus derechos legítimos. Eso dice el documento. Los derechos legítimos, no otros que no son tales derechos. Por ejemplo, se niega la posibilidad de identificar las uniones homosexuales con la familia, que tiene que estar que solamente tiene que merece ese nombre aquellas uniones formadas por un hombre y por una mujer. Hay un capítulo especialmente importante dedicado a la familia. Y se insiste, y esto es algo que llevamos toda la vida insistiendo, no es el Papa Francisco, es que es la misma cosa que han enseñado San Juan Pablo II, Benedicto XVI, igual lo mismo que ellos han enseñado con respecto al respeto debido a los homosexuales, pero sin que eso suponga el reconocimiento o la equiparación de la homosexualidad con la heterosexualidad de las uniones homosexuales con las uniones heterosexuales. Esto, los papas anteriores y exactamente igual este. Pues, re, decía, hay un capítulo dedicado a la familia en la que se deja muy claro que es la familia la que tiene el derecho fundamental en la educación de sus hijos y no el Estado, como en muchos sitios se está pretendiendo, que es el Estado el que quiere educar a los niños y cuando las familias se oponen son capaces, y ya hay casos en que esto sucede, de quitarle la tutela de los hijos a los padres. También se pide a la escuela católica que enseñe todo esto a los niños y jóvenes en las clases, en los colegios católicos, y que enseñe, dice que el matrimonio es el lugar donde debe ejercerse la sexualidad. Es decir, donde deben tener lugar las relaciones sexuales. Me parece suficientemente claro, no es ninguna novedad, pero es claro y es muy útil que lo diga el Vaticano, que lo diga con el refrendo del Papa. También se dice, por ejemplo, que el niño tiene derecho, el niño que es adoptado, tiene derecho a ser adoptado por un hombre y por una mujer, y no por dos hombres o por dos mujeres. Bueno, yo creo que con, con esto <ríe> me parece que no solamente queda zanjado el tema en cuanto a la enseñanza de la Iglesia, sino que también se abre un capítulo nuevo, y que me parece a mí bastante importante. ¿Por qué? Porque una parte grande de los que se han proclamado en estos años entusiastas del Papa Francisco han estado defendiendo justamente lo contrario de lo que el Papa ha dicho y de lo que ahora corrobora la Congregación para la Educación Católica. Es decir, muchos de los que se presentan como los más admiradores fervorosos del Papa Francisco enseñaban just sobre estos temas que enseñaban justamente lo contrario. Si son honestos y coherentes, tendrán que recapacitar, cambiar sus posiciones e incluso 
pedir perdón. Del mismo modo, tendrán que recapacitar aquellas instituciones educativas donde se ha enseñado una doctrina distinta a la que enseña la Iglesia e incluso se han dado premios y pienso en determinadas universidades, por ejemplo, a políticos o a intelectuales abiertamente a favor de la ideología de género. Resulta que la Iglesia oficialmente está diciendo con el Papa Francisco y por boca del Papa Francisco que la ideología de género tiene que ser rechazada y hay colegios y hay universidades donde esto, en cambio, se apoya y se premia a los que la defienden. Parece a mí que tiene que haber ahora unas consecuencias y también tendría que haber una petición de perdón, por ejemplo, a esas familias que se han visto ridiculizadas o mermadas en sus derechos en algunos colegios católicos cuando han pretendido que a sus hijos se les enseñara simplemente la doctrina de la iglesia. Creo que se hace, se ha hecho, y Dios quiera que no se haga más, pero temo que así ocurra, una manipulación tan grande del Papa Francisco que al final... Mucha gente cree que el Papa defiende cosas que él no ha defendido nunca. Con esto no quiero decir que todo lo haya hecho bien porque ningún ser humano hace todo bien. Pero desde luego en este tema, aborto, eutanasia, ideología de género, el Papa ha sido clarísimo. Otra cosa, repito, es que se haya hecho y se haga una manipulación tan grande de sus enseñanzas que pase él como defensor de todo lo contrario a lo que de verdad ha defendido. Creo que este documento tiene que servir a todos para hacer un examen de conciencia y Dios quiera que esos encendidos defensores de la ideología de género dentro de la iglesia, si siguen así, al menos no digan que están en sintonía, que están en, digamos, unidad eh, con lo que está enseñando el Papa. Hasta la semana que viene, si Dios quiere. If you wish to be up to date on everything happening in the Catholic Church, please follow our website at www.catolicosonline.org. Until next week, God willing.